Denny McMahon, welcome to Hidden Forces. Great to be here, Dimitri. So you're coming straight from the outback? Where are you coming from? <laughs> I told you when I saw you downstairs, I had to come get you because we, we were trying to find the location. And I was expecting someone in a suit and tie. I've seen you, you know, just like dressed in the nines, presenting at, you know, Wilson Center or wherever, hair slicked back in a suit, and here you come, and you look like you're you're out of like Crocodile Dundee movie. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't quite say that's the natural order of things, but uh, no, it's been, it's been a while since I've seen anything of the Australian outback. I've I've been in the U.S. for the last uh, few years. I live in Chicago these days. I had the good fortune of marrying an American woman, and so uh, really? after after living in China for eleven years, we we made our way to this part of the world. Did you meet her in China? Your we wife? did. We did. Um, um, there was a, an American at a American University campus in Nanjing. Uh, we met each other, and uh, really? yeah, the rest is history. How as long? They say. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago? It's so funny. You're the third person. So this is the third episode we've done on China, and all three of them have started with how they met their spouse. <laughs> with uh, with Anne, she met. I don't know how. You, if you know, we were introduced by Anne Stevenson Yang, who was episode sixteen, I think. She told me in that interview that she met her husband when she went to China. To be part, she was interested originally because she was interested in the ideas of Mao Zedong, and she was like, you know, kind of a revolutionary. She's like, this is finally someone understands the peasants. <laughs> so she went there, but she went in 1985 as part of like a. She was working at Business Week, and then she applied to a local newspaper there or whatever, and they accepted her. And then she was touring the country before 1989, and that's where she met her husband, Elizabeth Economy. She just mentioned that she ended up meeting her husband, and then kind of went off to the, I don't know, institute wilderness, like of an academia or whatever. And with you, you met your wife. When did you guys get married? Uh, about five years ago now. Okay, you didn't, you weren't prepared to talk about your personal relationship. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> it's, just, it's actually funny. I reckon I, I stayed in China as long as I did because of her, because I think you actually find when uh, you meet somebody from another country and you meet in a third country, it becomes a lot easier to stay there than having that conversation about, uh, are we going to move to the US or Australia? So yeah, in the end, yeah. we had that conversation and she won out. So uh, It's also interesting when you meet, it's an interesting experience meeting someone from your home country when you live abroad. Mm -hmm. It's a different type of relationship and also adjusting to coming back to your home country. Well, it's actually different with you because you're Australian. But if you were both to come back to the United States, let's say you were both American, it's an interesting experience for some couples. Sometimes it can be a good thing. Sometimes it's not. But the good thing with you guys is that you're one is American, one is Australian. <laughs> so um, let's talk about the subject that you're here to speak about today, which is China. The, you know, big word. As I said, we, we had the two other episodes on China. I've learned so much from those two episodes, and I feel like I'm more prepared today to talk about this than ever before. With Anne, as I mentioned, that was on the Chinese banking system and the financial system. With Elizabeth economy, it was focused more on the political system. What I came to understand through that process was that that distinction is not as clear in China as it is in the United States. Um, but... but uh, You've written a book called China's Great Wall of Debt. It's actually a lot about much more than just debt. It it's a, it's a, covers a wide range of, of issues that, that bleed into and outside of the political system. Maybe we can start with why you decided to write this book at this point in your life. It, is, uh, it was published March 2018, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, what prompted you to write this book, and how long had you been working on it? All right, yeah. Well, I spent 10 years as a financial journalist in China. Um, and the last six of those were specifically covering China's financial system. But over that course of that entire period, you kind of, being a, a foreign journalist in China can be an incredibly frustrating experience in terms of, uh, you know, getting straight answers from the authorities, even just working out how the system works, given that it is so radically different from how Western markets operate and, and just in terms of questions of access. And I certainly found over time that, no matter how much time I spent reporting on China issues, there were these kind of big gaps in my understanding of how the bigger picture all came together. And I certainly found over the last, my last few years at the Wall Street Journal, I was working on a whole lot of big picture stories, which on the face of it kind of felt unrelated. I was work, writing about zombie companies and shadow banking issues. I was working about you know, mass, you know, local government debt problems. And over time, I realized these were all interconnected, but what I really needed was the time to kind of work out how the system worked as a whole. And so I think as much as anything, it was after spending such a long time in China, writing a book was almost a cathartic experience because it was a way to step back and try and work out and really understand everything that I'd been looking at for years. 
So the process of how many, how many years were you working on it? Um, the stories that are in the book, all the anecdotes, because that's kind of you know how I've structured the the book. I'd been collecting for about six years. Now the point I hadn't realized initially that they they were going to make a book. Um, but so you weren't collecting them with the idea of putting because that's another thing I wanted to ask you, which is how does someone even write something like this? I find it I would find it overwhelming to piece together all these different stories. Um, but you weren't you weren't keeping those stories to write a book. They were just coming as part of your reporting. Yeah, absolutely. And once I kind of got an inkling that actually this would, this is this fits into a bigger picture, then I started revisiting some of these stories. Mm. I mean, so often you know, I was writing about ghost cities, for example, and so I went out and visited a ghost city a couple of times. And then when I realised that I was going to do more with this, then I kept going back. So I did a few more trips after that to kind of work out what had happened. And so that's kind of how the dynamic changed over my last couple of years as a journalist. What's that like going to a ghost city? <laughs> it is fascinating because, um, I mean, you know, to give a brief description of what, what it is, right? I mean, most people probably do understand at this point in time, but it kind of turns the idea of a ghost town on its head, right? So US West is dotted in ghost towns, which are places that sprung up in response to a specific demand. So invariably there was a gold rush or a silver rush and so people piled in, a town sprung up overnight, the people left just as quickly when the resources petered out. But a ghost city is firstly on a scale of magnitude inordinately bigger. And they How were, big are we talking here? Well, like some what of the, are the biggest ones, like what are we talking about? Well, some of these were the, the, the blueprints for the cities uh, were that one day they'd house a million people. Now, in terms of having sufficient housing, they're getting to a point where you've actually built a ghost city to those proportions. I'm not sure any city's actually got that big. But the one that I was writing about in Liaoning province in China's northeast could have comfortably um, sort of housed a sort of 100,000 people. Um, and so you turn up to these places and, you know, it's not that they don't have anybody living there. It's just because the Chinese government, local officials have ways of effectively creating at least a, a sort of a, a nucleus of a population, right? They'll, they'll close down the surrounding schools and force everybody to go into the new schools in the cities. They'll close down the existing um, hospitals and get everyone to use this one. Government buildings, it's like, you know, the, the local... Ministry of Education will all of a sudden find itself uh, being relocated to the ghost city. So you kind of have this kernel of a population, but then the city is built to a scale for far more people than will ever end up living there. It's like you said, it, it, it's doing ghost towns on its head. You build the city and then you do things like blow up on the, a school in one town and force the kids to go 50 miles to the other one. That, that was actually one of the stories that Anne gave us mm. uh, during that during her interview. It's amazing because doing that in particular has so many moving parts to it, right? So on one level, it's a way to get people living in the ghost city, right? But the other thing is, so if you're closing down a school in kind of an original large town or original city, invariably that is, you know, probably sitting on some pretty valuable property, right? So the moment that you close down that old school, that you can then sell it off, local government gets more revenue. Meanwhile, everyone moves to, you know, out to the, into this new city where the land is a lot cheaper. So it kind of works for the local government on a whole lot of different levels. I want to get into that. We're going to get into, into that sort of the perverse incentives that exist in China because I think that's such a big part of the mystery of how the, the system works. I don't think we're going to solve any major mysteries here because uh, I think the, the my experience of China is the more I look into it, the more confused I get. But there is some level of understanding that comes out of out of engaging with the subject. You mentioned numbers uh, or the or the control, how the, the challenge of being a reporter in China. One of my subtitles here for the interview is lies, damn lies and statistics. <laughs> I think, you know, in America and in the West, I guess more more broadly, we have an expectation that numbers are massaged. We have an expectation that statistics are used to bolster a position. You cherry pick statistics. But there's some sense of sanctity. There's some sense in which the numbers didn't arise out purely out of, out of an arbitrary process or purely to support some specific um, alternative number or objective. As I understand it, numbers in China operate in a very different way and then in some sense the number is is a, a target that signals to the rest of the system what to do um, explain to me w why it's so challenging to report and how someone from the west 
or from you're not from the West, I guess you're from Australia. <laughs> well, we say but ourselves. From... <laughs> <laughs> but how do you how do you do your job, and what have you learned about how the Chinese relate to numbers? Okay, so I mean, certainly working for the Wall Street Journal, pretty much every story you write revolves around data. So. Um, the data problem in China has a lot of different aspects to it. So on one level, there is this sense that well, there, you know, there's some truth to it, that some Chinese data just is outright incorrect. I mean, for all intents and purposes, it's, it's propaganda. I know Anne made this point that in, often it's a target, but often it's propaganda. I mean, you take something like the GDP figures. No one really believes that the GDP figures is, is what Beijing says in any given quarter. They're just too smooth. There is no possible way that the numbers are It's like Bernie Madoff's portfolio. 15% <laughs> every year. That is a perfect way to describe it, right? <laughs> that is, the, the numbers just don't change as much as they could. Cons it must be changing for a country with 1.4 billion people. So there's that. And so in some ways, that's kind of, it's, it's propaganda. And I think often foreigners kind of look at that and they just kind of feel like the Chinese are, it's almost a personal slight that the Chinese are lying to us. When they put out these numbers, it's, it's us that they're lying to. When for the most part, so much of the, the problems with Chinese data, it's, it's a real problem and a frustration to the people living within the system. Now, sometimes you have things like GDP, which is, kind of has a propaganda purpose. Sometimes the problem is, um, you know, local uh, officials, they have a target that they have to meet or they have to show that they're being particularly successful at, uh, you know, achieving a certain level of growth or bringing in a, a certain, generating a, a certain amount of employment. And so they often just outright lie about the numbers and then they pass that up the supply, you know, up the chain of command and then level above them lies to their su superiors and on and on all the way out to the top. Sometimes the big problem, particularly as a journalist, is that you find a figure and then, you know, it's published by the central bank and then the next month or the next quarter or the next year, that figure just doesn't exist anymore. So you don't have comparable data from one period to the next. Or another huge frustration is that they change the definitions. Same issue. You can't compare it from period to period. And that sort of opacity is almost a, it's sort of a tool of governance. If you can't, as an outsider or even in, inside the system, if you can't tell exactly what's going on with the system and the economy, then that gives the authorities a certain degree of power and control to be able to control the narrative of what they want you to believe is going on. And so, yeah, as a journalist, this can be incredibly frustrating. And you, you spend, after a while, you kind of work out that, you know, you can find new and interesting data sources that aren't being massaged because no one's really looking at them. No one thinks they're important. And so you can kind of dig out interesting stories from stuff that just isn't really getting much attention. Would an example of that be before the Chinese government uh, got wise to it, but would an example be electricity in China? At some point, as I understand it, electricity is being used as a way to figure out what actually economic activity looked like. Uh, and then, of course, people started leaving the lights on. <laughs> as, I, as I understand it. <laughs> yeah, well, this was um, what, uh, you, what, what was, is, is referred to as the Li Keqiang Index, Li Keqiang being current, China's current premier. And uh, in one of the WikiLeak, WikiLeaks leaks years ago, there was a, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a conversation leaked from the U.S. embassy between the U.S. ambassador and Li Keqiang. And Li Keqiang out, came out and said that GDP data is man-made and that he doesn't look at it for an indication of the health of the, Australia, of the Chinese economy. And what he looks at is freight, uh, electricity, and I forget what the third one was. And, you know, whilst that could have worked quite well as a proxy for real growth at the time, once more and more people started looking at that, then, uh, you know, the people who were in a position to control that information sort of woke up to, to that and sort of started massaging the numbers, however, you know, by leaving the lights on. Well, a very perverse incentive. Uh, just to reiterate something you said or to bolster a previous point, there's a quote in your book where you cite someone who, when asked whether you asked him or whether it was something that you were per pulling from some other anecdote about, about uh, why not be more transparent about some particular data set. And his point was, why would we do that? Doing that would actually hurt us because of uh, you know the fallout that would come from being honest about some particular situation or whatever. And, and, and you emphasize that, I think, to, to make the point that there is a, a different, it sounds like in, in China, their relationship to, to facts or to truth is, it's, it's uh, I mean, not that we're, we have a great record here in the United States or anything like that, but that, that they still, there's such a desire to control, whether it's the narrative, whether it's the economy, um, that they don't see the benefits of liberalization as much as we do. 
which I think also speaks to this larger challenge of getting there, right? That that sort of the reform. And again, even that word, as I understand it in China, it means can mean so many different things. Let's um, one. I, I would love for you to try and explain to me and to our audience. We, I've, we've gone through this with Anne. We've gone through it with Elizabeth, and I want to go with through it with you. How the Chinese system, for as you would describe it, is organized? How does how does the state apparatus fit into the economy? Fit into the, you know, the the government from from the center, from Beijing to the provincials to the to the local governments. How does all of that operate? Can you try and paint some picture for us? You know, one of the reasons that is quite difficult is in, in some ways it's a moving target. All right. So when I wrote the book. Um, the, th this is how I would have des described it. So I think outsiders typically sort of see China as being, often they see it as either being communist, or they see it as being capitalist. Certainly if they see it as communist, they see the Chinese Communist Party as being all powerful. What the president or the chairman says has an inordinate amount of, of power. Um, it is, is effectively a Kremlin imposing its will on the rest of the economy. And that's not how China has ever worked. Uh, lower levels of authority, whether that be the executive of a state-owned enterprise or a provincial governor, a city mayor, or even a person in charge of a township, they have an incredible amount of autonomy to do what they believe is right for the local uh, community. Certainly that's within, you know, with, within reason because they're all part of this sort of, you know, communist party structure and they, you know, they report to the level immediately above them. However, at the same time, they have a lot of um, uh, ability to either push back against what Beijing is telling them to do, or most often, and this is what we've seen over time and time again over the last decade, is that they get creative in the ways that they get around the rules. From above there is policy, from below there are countermeasures. Yeah. How do you say it in Mandarin? <laughs> 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 it's funny, for, foreign journalists love this other expression, which is, you know, the, the mountains are high and the government's far away, which is kind of this idea that the further you get away from Beijing, the sort of the less authority Beijing has. But that particular expression, <laughs> that was the expression in our bureau, because we just saw it time and time again, that there'd be something that would come out. In particular, Beijing would be trying to crack down on shadow banking. And all of a sudden the world would go, oh, wow, you know, the, the data's changing. You know, all of a sudden, you know, trust loans have been re re reined in. Beijing is finally taking this debt accumulation hand in hand. And then after a while, you kind of realize, no, what actually happened is that the financial system just got creative and conspired with local governments just to come up with new ways to lend that no one's been looking at. Mm. And that, I think, has been the dominant economic trend for the last decade. But that's starting to change a little bit now. Um, uh, that, you know, I don't know where you were going exactly before I made you speak Mandarin, which <laughs> I, I would love to do again one more time with another quote. But um, th you were talking about the, 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 the local governments and this kind of weird relationship between the, the Beijing and some of these provincial areas, or like, I don't know how they all break down. The thing that I find remarkable, and I'd love for you to shed some light on it, is how this works where they're required or expected to spend uh, and yet they don't have the, the way that they collect is not straightforward tax revenue, right? Like, for example, you give the example of the value added tax that local governments, as I understand it, are incentivized to prop up zombie companies because zombie companies, even if they're not profitable, as long as they're generating revenue, you're able to tax those because they're 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 generating they're creating stuff and a, and a VAT tax taxes the the component parts that are coming out of the factory basically. Uh, they're incentivized to do that because they're able they're getting 25 percent of that tax, whereas they have to wait to negotiate to get the money from Beijing, which is basically like this this su suction action where the the center center sucks up capital and then redistributes it out. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that perverse sort of relationship, how that works. And then again, to, to reemphasize the point, it seems that's the, that's the challenge of how do you take a system that works so differently and try to turn it into what we have, which is supposedly what the Chinese economy is supposed to transition into? Um, okay. Well, I'd say probably the, the biggest problem with the local governments is the incentive structure, right? So let's say you're a, a local... Uh, so the, the, the thing that uh, local officials get judged on whether they've been successful or not is there to a degree it's their de degree to which they have been able to stimulate economic growth 
But perhaps the most important metric of that is the degree to which they've been able to increase tax revenue. And so there's a few ways they go about it. So in terms of their relationship with companies, that's where this zombie problem that you were talking to comes to, right? Because a zombie company is still generating VAT, which is effectively a sales tax. It is still generating tax that goes directly to the local governments as long as it's making sales. So it could be, you know, using a fraction of its capacity. It might be only operating at 60% of its capacity. It might be hemorrhaging money. But the cost of keeping that company alive falls to the financial system, whereas the benefits of keeping that alive is the taxation that feeds into the local, uh, lo, you know, into the local coffers. And that's really important to the local officials because they get judged on their ability to generate taxation. If they shut down that firm, all of a sudden they're receiving less tax and they have to pay out more money out of their own pockets to sort of pay off pensions and sort of maybe land remediation and all sorts of other issues. And so it's their interest to keep the company alive, the com these companies alive. Um, and then this sort of feeds through with the sort of the infrastructure construction as well. The local governments aren't in, you know, up until recently, the government's sort of been tweaking the way that the local governments sort of fund infrastructure construction. But traditionally, they haven't been able to pay for it out of taxes or out of revenue. And so the way they've paid for infrastructure is through land sales. And so you've kind of had this situation where the local officials have been hugely incentivized to um, appropriate land from, you know, farmers in the surrounding hinterland, uh, taking it from them at, at you know, cutthroat prices and selling them to property developers, which then give the local authorities the resources they need to build the infrastructure, which is then necessary to stimulate the economic growth, which they need to prove that they've been a good official. So these sort of perverted uh, incent political incentive schemes have, which, which are, you know, if you're sitting in Beijing, certainly back in, you know, at a time kind of looked inspired, it was a way of standardising the way that you judge uh, officials throughout the entire country uh, on, on the same sort of metric. But the way that's fed through into the way the economy has worked has had really uh, destructive, uh, a really destructive impact. So you mentioned the... Um the, the government's role in, in uh, claiming land from farmers. N no one actually owns land in China, right? It's, it's given right. on these, like, what, 80-year leases? It depends on the land. So residential land, I think it's 70-year lease. Commercial land is 50, and agricultural land is 30-year leases. Okay. There's a quote from your book that I pulled out here about this because this has come up over and over again in my research in China. And you write, land lies at the heart of China's investment boom, and it's why the country's economic boom is so fragile. Let's talk a little bit about the role of real estate in China, the role that these perverse incentives have played in creating booms in real estate. Um, what, uh, what, how, how, how can a Westerner think about the, 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 the real estate market in China? What's driving it? And what on what scale is the you know the bubble in Chinese real estate? How localized is it? How nationwide is it? How important is this is the real estate story in China? Right. I think the best way to think of real estate in China is that it's not one market. I mean, it's probably not even fair to say that it's two. But thinking of it as two markets is kind of probably the best way that for us to go at it here. On one level, you have um, a whole lot of uh, housing that's kind of been built in China's smaller cities. And a lot of that has been built for really for speculative purposes because, um, you know, it, the, the, nominally the reason that you've had a huge expansion in housing in a lot of small places in China was this vision that, you know, we've got had hundreds of millions of people moving from the countryside to the cities, that somehow that was going to affect all Chinese cities equally, whereas in actual fact that's not what happened. So you've got a lot of cities that never actually experienced that inflow of migration, but they kind of built um, housing in anticipation that it would happen. And people bought that housing because it became an investment. And this is one of the things it's, you know, bricks and mortar has traditionally been the single most investment avenue for, for, for Chinese people. And so you've had a huge amount of money that's gone into it. Why is that? Well, going traditionally, the reason has been because China's financial markets just haven't been deep enough. You know, the stock market, uh, you know, only got going in the 90s. There weren't enough stocks. And then at the end of the day, it was really a ca casino. Um, and so if 
people wanted a, a relatively secure and accessible financial asset that they could invest in, it ended up being property. Of course, part and parcel of this as well is China's capital controls, which meant that Chinese people couldn't take their money and invest overseas. So, you know, bonds originally was a fairly thin market. The stock market was a thin market. All that was really left was property. Now, that's changed over recent years, particularly starting probably in 2009 with this flourishing of the shadow banking market. You've had a massive expansion of the bond market. Uh, you know, the, the, the stock market's got significantly bigger. You've had this proliferation of fixed income pro products called wealth management products. But at the same day, uh, same time, property still kind of does occupy a very special place in the investment decisions of Chinese people. And so there is still kind of this you know, incentive to, you know, not first buy a home and if you have the resources to buy an investment property. What do people mean when they talk about the shadow banking system in China? I've heard you talk about it a number of times. I'm not really clear on what it is. Right. So um, the shadow banking system in China is it's a collection of non-bank financial institutions. And so the way to think of China's financial system is well, it's kind of a bit like the island of misfit toys. Right. So from a distance, they can't, everything kind of looks familiar. But once you get up close, you kind of realize that things are, are not quite the, 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 the way they that's seem. A, that's a reference from the 19, what is it, 72, Rudolph the... Rudolph the Red Nose. Christmas classic, Rudolph the Red Nose. Christmas Rain. classic with the abominable <laughs> snowman. Maybe That's 1968. Right. That's 66, right. 66, something like that. Something like that. Um, and so, you know, you kind of have, you know, trust companies, for example. Now, trust companies aren't like trusts in the United States. What, what they became in China was effectively almost, they, they're kind of like special purpose vehicles. They're a way to sort of raise money from the public or increasingly from the banks and then sort of make loans to companies or to local governments or whatever. So what the shadow banking system was almost a, a, a parallel financial system to the banks that was a, a way of raising credit to lend to property developers, to but pretty much get yeah, private sector, anyone who needed credit. But the thing is, as with sort of the, the Western version, I, I said it was a parallel system, but in actual fact, there's all these links between the formal banking system and the shadow banking system. And the reason that this shadow system exists is because it does the things that the formal banks aren't allowed to do or supposed to do because of um, regulatory efforts to make them safer. So because the banks can't do a whole lot of risky stuff, they kind of cooperate with the shadow banking system to be able to do it in, instead. And that was kind of really what fed this sort of huge explosion of debt in, in, in the Chinese economy because, you know, Beijing could, you know, the regulators recognised the risks. They kind of saw that property developers and local governments, you know, industries suffering over capacity, they were getting away, they were expanding too much and they really needed to get less credit. And so they told the banks, lend less. And the way the banks responded was by cooperating with the shadow banks to be able to keep the flow of credit moving into these sectors of the economy. Um, now, this dynamic's changed a little bit since the beginning of last year. Finally, Xi Jinping, um, because he's, he's managed to consolidate so much power in his own hands because of the crackdown on corruption, he's now been in a position to kind of uh, change the dynamic a little bit such that the shadow banking system has been massively reined in since, you know, since the middle of last year. Now, having said all that, Things seem to be changing now again because Beijing is getting seriously worried about the trade war. Growth is slowing, and you know they're trying to stimulate the economy again. And so when they start stimulating, they start to relax a little bit on shadow banking. And so conceivably, the pro the progress that we've seen made since the beginning of last year looks as though it might be going into reverse again. Because every time they make the reforms that they need to, it's going to come with some pain and the pain hurts and no one likes pain. Absolutely, there's this, I guess, a, a political threshold of how much growth is acceptable. And actually working out where that threshold is, it's, it's a moving target. I mean, for, for years when I first started as a journalist, that target was eight. There was this political slogan that we needed to maintain it was the 8% annual growth. And so growth was 12%, 10%, 11%, but it always had to be above eight. And then in recent years, it's slipped below that. There's been this realization that you know, China doesn't need to create the, the volume of jobs that it needed back then when 8% was seen as so important. So now it's a question of like, what is the key number? 
And Jesus. one one idea is that, okay, well, Xi Jinping wants the size of the economy to double between, I think, 2010, 2020 to be able to hit the 2020 target. China needs to grow at least, I think, 5.5% for the next few years. And so it's like, is that the new level? Or is there another political consideration going on? Or is it really about the, the stress that people are, are feeling at a local level? If growth gets below, say, 6.5%, do you really start seeing ordinary people feel the stress of that slowing growth in certain parts of the country? And so, you know, the authorities in Beijing see something that the rest of us don't. And so are like, OK, we, we've got to stimulate at this point because it's just not politically sustainable to let growth slow any further. Does that sound as asinine to you as it sounds to me? <laughs> You know, maybe I've I've just spent too long reporting on China because I mean, it if just... it was that, if, if that you know if that were if it were that easy, Easter Island would have been the most successful civilization mm. in the history of humanity. Yeah. I mean, if growth were as easy as well, we want to hit this target. Let's go. I mean, I guess that's another way of asking: What kind of malinvestment are we looking at for the Chinese economy? Obviously, you don't know, but. I mean, what? What? Give me a fuzzy sense. Like, what are we talking about here? Obviously, these ghost cities are malinvestment. There's a lot of it there. But how much could be lurking under the surface that because of the way that they direct investment in China and also the, as you've made the point, the other, another thing here, maybe you could say this in Chinese, numbers make officials so officials make up numbers. This relationship, this relationship to information and, and opacity and the bending of the rules. You know, uh, what are we looking at here? It, it, it's the scariest thing of this entire story for me. Mm. So if we're talking about malinvestment, there's kind of the stuff that you can see and there's the question of how we quantify it. So the malinvestment turns up most obviously with industries that are suffering overcapacity. So you have this situation where I think the government itself, at least a few years ago, had a list of almost two dozen industries in which there was overcapacity, which is like everything from steel. So steel is a great example. I mean, I think in 2003, China was still a net importer of steel. A couple of years ago, at least, China was a, was exporting more steel to the rest of the world than was being produced by being produced, that is, by Canada the United States and Mexico combined. And so you had this, China is currently capable of producing more steel than it could ever conceivably hope to use. Well, you said in the book that they have the single biggest, like, what is it, forge, what's it called? Oh, that, that, that wasn't actually producing steel. That's another industry that's suffering overcapacity. But this was like a, a company that makes the machines that factories need. So this was a company that makes the mills for, you know, for, for you know, it makes steel mills, it makes power producing plants. And it's suffering massive overcapacity because all those sorts of industries are suffering overcapacity. But they've built things that they can't even use because yeah. they don't have the demand yet for it. Going back to the point about building, you know, uh, apartment buildings where people haven't moved in. Absolutely. And there was that other story you had about the ballpoint pens that they couldn't make <laughs> ballpoint pens because they didn't have that fine level of engineering, even though they make like 80% of the world's pens. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a, a slightly different issue. We can get right. into that a little bit because that speaks volumes about the trade conflict at the moment. But in terms of malinvestment, first issue is the overcapacity we were talking about. The second one is local governments building infrastructure and public works. That's a big thing to think. It's not just infrastructure, it's public works, like government buildings, ornament mental lakes, stuff like that, that they can't pay for or is just massively underutilized and will never kind of have the economic payoff that justifies the investment. And then, of course, there's the empty housing. So it then becomes a question of how you quantify this. And it, the issue is, well, what is, in any other country, the way you'd look at it is like, what is the non-performing loan ratio in China? But the official data in China doesn't mean anything. I mean, I think it's currently at the banks, something like 1.8% of all loans are officially recognized as being non-performing. Now that's slightly worse than the United States, but slightly better than Germany. So that kind of gives you an idea. I mean, it's a complete, It's that number has no meaning whatsoever. And quite interestingly, at the beginning of this year, the Chinese banking regulator actually published an essay in which it outlined the various ways that the banks were lying about their bad loans. So it's then a question of, okay, so if the number isn't real, what is the real figure? And this is an open question. I mean, I've seen estimates anywhere from, you know, 4% to 20%. And even when you come up with a number like that, 
it's like, well, that might be the figure today, but that ratio will go up as the Chinese economy continues to slow. You've got to remember, this is an economy which borrowed money in the expectation that the economy would grow at significantly higher rates. The more the economy slows, the more bad loans there will be. And that is, I think, something that's clearly keeping Beijing awake at the moment as the, as the trade war bites, because they're already facing slower growth and the, the tariffs and the trade war will you would expect will put even more pressure on that growth. It's like pushing on a string. Let's talk about the trade war. Let's talk about the economic war. One of the things that uh, I've been noticing in the signaling, whether I'm listening to Donald Trump, whether I'm listening to Mike Pence, who recently um, spoke out against China, um, he, uh, I believe he said that, uh, well, I have the quote here, that uh, I mean, well, interestingly enough, I think what's interesting is I think the, the Trump administration is beginning, they're very politically astute, and Steve Bannon was actually out uh, speaking as well about, he's been talking up this point about rerouting the global supply chain for a while. Uh, economic war with China is a central aspect of the platform because it really resonates with a population that I think um, rightly sees a level of uh, unfairness with respect to how the United States and the Chinese relationship has evolved, at least if you're a part of the Rust Belt. Um, what's going on with uh with with the trade war, what sort of like uh, what impact have the tariffs had, and uh, how are the Chinese seeing this? What can you tell us about about this? Yeah, right. So I think uh, up until only recently, trade war hasn't really had much of an impact. I think that started to change in the most recent trade data, um, because up until now, because people have been seeing the uh, the the tariffs coming down the, the turnpike, they've been front loading their exports. And so Chinese exports, generally speaking, have been pretty robust over the last you know few months. I think that changed a little bit in, in, in September. Um, I think the real big impacts over the next however months, however years, it'll depend on whether, you know, currently there's, you know, most recently the Trump administration put a 10% tariff on $200 billion worth of, of, of Chinese exports to the US. Um, they they retain, retain the right to increase that to 25% on the 1st of January. And Trump's also said that uh, if China retali retaliates in a meaningful way, then the US could put another 200, and, uh, more tariffs on another $250 billion worth of goods. Now, generally speaking, you know, China isn't as dependent on exports as it once was. Um, I think only 4% of GDP is Chinese exports to the US, which is down is about half the level of 2008. But the thing is, this starts to change the dynamic behind or the incentive behind um, foreign companies building factories in China, even Chinese factories operating their factories in China. So w one of the, the factors that is generally overlooked is that China isn't a cheap place to manufacture anymore. And this is something that's been changing fairly aggressively in the last few years, and there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, the cost of land, for example. I know one Chinese entrepreneur, and I write, him, write about him in the book, who you know was expanding his textile mill. He was based in Zhejiang province, kind of the, uh, the heartland for private industrial companies in China. And he moved to South Carolina because the cost of the land was just so much cheaper. Um, you know, energy prices are going up again because of, you know, fracking and shale in the United States. The U.S., if push comes to shove, the U.S. is in a position to have lower energy costs than, than China. And once again, this was one of the factors that drove out this textile producer a few years back. Environmental compliance. Mm -hmm. You know, once upon a time, that's why foreign companies moved to China in the first place, because China didn't worry about the impact of manufacturing on the environment. Mm. That has radically changed in the last few years because China is not just dealing with air pollution, but huge water supply and pollution issues and, you know, soil pollution. Soil right? Twenty percent of the la of land is non-arable that would otherwise be arable. Absolutely. Is that right? It's a huge problem. And then you've kind of got the big issue is wages. And so traditionally, there's always been this vision that China had almost this endless supply of workers moving from the countryside to take factory jobs. And what we assumed was endless turned out to have an end. I mean, that supply of migrants looking for industri you know, industrial and manufacturing jobs in the cities has slowed to a trickle. And at the same time, the, uh, you know, the, the fallout of the one child policy is finally starting to be felt, which is China has a shrieking, shrinking um, working age population. You put all that together and China is becoming a less and less uh, the, the, the cost bent, you know, the, you know, more and more expensive place to actually make stuff. You put a 10% tariff on that, you put a 25% tariff, and you're really accelerating this process, which meant that 
China really needs to change the composition of its industry in a hurry so that it's producing more highly value added stuff that isn't going to leave China because it's just too expensive to manufacture. What a challenge. Let's let, uh, stick on this a little bit with the one child policy. The median age in China is roughly equivalent to the United States, about 38, right? Uh, but that doesn't that doesn't really capture the picture, right? Because you've got this abnormal uh, v vacuum, demographic vacuum that's born out of the, the the one child policy, right? That's right. How does that manifest? Where where how and when do we see that? It's already started. So, the, when uh, was the policy put in place? To tell us, uh, I'm going to say 1979. Mm -hmm. um, so originally, that had real economic dividends for China, right? So if you have, you know, if you only have one child per family, then that kind of frees up both parents really to work because, you know, you can kind of give that one child to the grandparents to raise, um, you know, there's less state resources going towards taking care of, of children. And so the dividend was there was only one child. So you had more, more adults effectively working in, you know, in, in, you know, in the workforce. And now that's been completely turned on its head. And I think it was in 2012 that the, w the size of the working age population started to shrink. And that's going to have two major fallouts between, I, I forget what year that sort of, that, that sort of the, 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 the pop working age population sort of shrinks to its minimum size. I know by 2030, I mean, the impacts of this are really going to have a significant impact on the economy. So about 100 million fewer people that's or something right. like that? Yeah, I forget under, over what, what period it might be about 15 years. Um, but it's on one hand, people in the work, the number of people in the workforce are shrinking. And on the other hand, you have more people who are retired. And so the, the drain on the healthcare system and on pensions is, um, ec you know, is significantly greater. And at the same time, more people have to be taken out of the workforce in order to take care of the, the aging population. So it, it really does present a pretty significant challenge to the structure of the economy in, in the not so distant future. Now, I was thinking of something though when when I was reading that, which is that it also to to the point of the trade wars and stuff like this, automation is increasingly what's what's threatening jobs, manufacturing jobs. It isn't low wage uh, labor, correct? Um, in other words, that that the Chinese are going to have to face threats from automation, irrespective of of whether they can be competitive as a lowering their labor costs, right? You would think so. I mean, so far, everything I've read and I've heard about automation in China isn't so much about people losing out their jobs to it. But yeah, you would imagine that would happen. You'd be kind of be in a position where if you're going to retain furniture factories or toy factories or textiles factories, there are two options. It can either stay in China and those jobs can be taken over by factory, by machines, or they could move to Cambodia. Because my, my thought was really, you know, if, if China didn't have the debt problems it has, what would what would the, the the structural demographic issues really mean, right? And I think they would mean they would mean it could, in some sense, be an opportunity as well, particularly given the the levels of population in the country, the the levels of pollution, and you know, if we get increasing automation, people, the, the fact that there would be fewer people could actually be, could actually be a benefit. But you've got unfunded. I don't know how if you they they're considered unfunded liabilities in in China, okay. but. But, uh, you know, this would probably be a good opportunity to talk about the debt because the, mm. the demographics are one thing, but when you combine them with the debt, the picture becomes all of a sudden very different. Yeah, yeah, the debt picture is, is quite interesting. Um, so, I mean, uh, the IMF, the Bank for International Study, uh, Bank for International Settlements, a number of central bankers around the world, I mean, even Chinese officials in recent years have been sort of warning that if, the debt continues to increase, and particularly if it increased at in both at both the pace and the way that it was accumulating, particularly through those shadow banking mechanisms I was talking about. If things continued in that direction, then it was really potentially destabilizing to the Chinese economy. I mean, the IMF points out that almost every other economy that has accumulated this much debt this quickly has experienced some sort of financial crisis. Mm -hmm. um, the Bank for International Settlements has has a has a, a whole lot of measures um, by which it assesses whether a co country is facing a financial crisis, and they're all kind of 
flashing red for China is kind of how the, the, the way the BIS says it. And so, yeah, the, the, the debt levels are, are at hugely elevated levels. So the question then is what do they do about it? And so, you know, starting last year, Xi Jinping managed to launch what he calls a deleveraging campaign. Now, that's something of a misnomer because the absolute level of debt hasn't decreased. And in fact, the, the, the size of the debt relative to the size of the economy continues to increase because that's the way the economy grows. China's economy is dependent on investment led debt fueled growth. And that requires at the moment for debt to expand faster than the pace of growth. And so rather than what's been happening, rather than calling it a deleveraging campaign, the best way to think of it is as a de-risking campaign. And so they've been reigning in shadow banking. They've been pushing the banks to write off their bad loans more aggressively. And the whole idea is trying to make the system less risky so that it can continue effectively you know, exp you know, lending more money in the short term so it can support growth. Is that is that also another way of saying more accountable? No, no, <laughs> no I don't so, think it's more accountable. So, like for example, with the banks, it's not saying you need to be more accountable for your bad loans. It's not because they still know that the government will save them. The government will will bail them out. Yeah, well, if you're looking at the bad loans. Um, you know, sure, they're writing off more bad loans, but the non the the, the non performing loan level that they're disclosing still bears no resemblance hmm. to reality. I mean, they they're writing off more and more bad loans, but the level of the NPL ratio just doesn't change. And so there is, you know, by some estimates, at the pace that they're writing off these bad loans, it could take a decade at least to sort of deal with this non performing loan ratio. Now that doesn't suggest, uh, you know. A level of accountability. This feels like more a sort of a negotiation or a, a compact between the government and the banks that we're going to slowly deal with this problem and the government will sort of help keep everything stable until they've sort of worked through these issues. But I don't think that's a, a question of accountability, whether it be accountability to the public or shareholders or, or, or whatever. So let's talk about Chairman Xi because the thing I learned from reading your book that I did not know it, with Elizabeth, we discussed at length his con the consolidation of power in China and that how some say he's even amassed more power than Chairman Mao. What I didn't realize, and you make the point in the book, is that that consolidation of power is actually part and parcel of the reform process, that the, 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 the way in, in which there are all these different counteracting or uh, countervailing incentives in China working against each other towards the, working and working against reform and against the, the, the stated goals of the body politic that the consolidation of power by Ch by Chairman Xi is part of the way that they're going to actually be able to reform the country right mm -hmm. how is that reform how is that process going first of all has he the consolidation of power is that that's still ongoing? And uh, and and how is how is he going to do that? And how is that whole process coming along? Yeah. So um, when Xi Jinping launched his anti-corruption campaign, you know, everyone's kind of spent a long a long time trying to work out what he was trying to achieve. And I think in hindsight, he had a lot of goals. There, there, there wasn't just one thing he was trying to achieve. And so on one level, he was really dealing with corruption, and he continues to do it. I mean that. When he came to power, there was perhaps no other issue that was a source of frustration among ordinary Chinese people than the degree um, and the excess of official corruption in China. Mm. So that was one thing he was dealing with. And then there was, you know, dealing with political rivals. And then one of the other real benefits of this is he's managed to smack heads, so to speak, to a sufficient degree that lower levels of uh, officials aren't willing to kind of do an end run around what Beijing asks of them anymore. If something is asked of them by Beijing, if there's a rule or regulation, some sort of diktat, they now do what they're told. And so she has managed to consolidate a huge amount of power in his hands. And so that means that something like the deleveraging, de-risking campaign is significantly more successful than similar eff efforts in the past because people are doing what they're told. So on one level, yeah, that's been important for the reform process. However, the other side of this equation is that everybody is so terrified of doing the wrong thing that that is having an impact on the ability to reform the economy as well. And so um, there is kind of this uh, almost inertia in the bureaucracy because uh, officials are worried of showing any initiative just in case it's the wrong thing or they kind of get sig signaled out or, you know, 
for whatever reason. Or that when there is something that is asked of them, um, they then, you know, if they're asked to jump so high, they'll jump twice as high to kind of prove their loyalty. And we've kind of seen a couple of instances like, like that. Um, you know, last year when uh, the authorities were implementing or uh, sort of introducing gas heating to China's northeast, the rollout ended up being far too aggressive, far too quickly, such that there wasn't enough gas to go around through, in, through this sort of frigid winter. And so a whole lot of people were left without heating because um, these uh, officials were trying to show their loyalty to Xi Jinping to such an extent that you know, the, this whole sort of, you know, the, the, to, 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 to the extent that um, they overdid it. And so this is kind of the problem. On one hand, to be able to impose top-down reform, she has had to break down the system and consolidate a lot of power in his hands. The problem with that is that you then end up with inertia and sycophantic officials and no one willing to show the sort of initiative in dealing with economic problems, which back in the 80s and the 90s was one of the great strength of the Chinese system and kind of allowed local areas to to really sort of experiment and, and sort of drive ahead with economic reform. Well, there was a huge cultural flourishing during the 1980s, right, that led up to Tiananmen Square. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you, I think so often we kind of look at the fact that Ch China is won by, run by one party and we kind of s see sort of the entire period of the last 50, 60 years as sort of being in one hue or one tone. But the, the sort of social change and the political to and fro that's gone on in China you know, since 1979 has been great as, as great as anything experienced in the United States. And so, yeah, the, the China of the 1980s, even the China of when I moved there as a journalist in 2004, 2005, was significantly more open than it is today. What is the biggest fear of the Chinese leadership? If you could identify it. Um, I, I, look, I'd, I'd be guessing, given I don't sure. have a particularly close relationship with them. Well, what but... do you think? I mean, well, what, uh, the reason I ask it is because one of the things that I've heard, and I think you've mentioned it as well, is the middle income trap, mm. that Chinese officials are terrified that they're not going to be able to achieve escape velocity, and they're going to get stuck in that sort of area between a developing and a developed economy. Yeah. And I think demographics are a big part of that. Their demographics are not great for a country that's still developing, that's at about 8,000, what is it, uh, the average, uh, the income, average income, for, yeah. income for, for an adult. Uh, can you explain to us what that is and, and why they're so afraid of it? Yeah, this is their vision of, uh, you know, after 40 years of fast-paced growth, all of a sudden, rather than naturally segueing from being a developing a country and becoming an OECD nation, a rich nation, as the trajectory would suggest, instead they hit a wall, as almost every other developing country has, and they end up sort of mired in this permanent state of being a developing economy. So this idea was first drummed up by the World Bank. Um, a few years ago, a batch of economists did a survey of, I think it was 101 countries that could be fairly interpreted or defined as being middle income in 1960. So middle income, they weren't rich nations, they weren't you know, poor nations, they were kind of, you know, they were developing economies. Um, and they found that by 2008, only 13 of those 101 had actually transitioned into being rich nations. And almost every, so many of the others had seemed to be on track, you know, whether it be in Mexico or Argentina, there were periods where they were growing extremely aggressively. You know, Malaysia, Thailand, the, Asia, uh, the Asian tigers mm -hmm. during, um, you know, the late 1990s. And then they hit a crisis or some sort of other economic event and they never made the transition. And that's what China worries about. And I think more than anything, that's kind of what, on the economic side of things, that's what keeps them up at night. And there are so many factors that could sort of feed into aggravating that. And one of them, as you said, is the population issue. There's this been this long held concern that China will become uh, old before it becomes rich. And the, the more the population, working age population mm -hmm. shrinks, the harder it is to become rich because all of a sudden you know, you've got less people working and you all have to start redirecting resources towards an aging population. So I think uh, what one of sort of the, the, the underlying tensions of the trade conflict at the moment is that Beijing came up with a solution for sort of dealing with its middle income trap. And this was this recognition that it can't continue growing the economy as it is, which is driven by debt. So they need a new model of economic growth. And that new model was to force march the economy 
up the value added chain out of sort of, uh, you know, away from investing in infrastructure and housing, away from low end textile manufacturing and into industries that required a greater de degree of technology. Because when they look around and they see developed economies, that's what they look like. They're high end manufacturing industries. And so that was the vision. That is how they will change the Chinese economy. But the way that they've decided to do that is by targeting a whole lot of you know, high end tech industries such as semiconductors, electric vehicles, robotics, and by achieving um, sort of either w a degree of dominance or, or building up those industries using things like subsidies and non-tariff barriers and quotas and um, you know state funds to buy foreign technology. Oh, I, 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 I've never heard you use that phrase before. They're afraid of becoming old before they become rich. Mm -hmm. I really the, that uh, I really like that, and it it makes me think about the unfair. Uh, metric by which all developing economies, maybe unfair is the wrong word, uh, unrealistic metric by which all developing economies are, are judging success at this point because they've seen what the United States has done, what the Brits have done, sort of the Anglo world. They industrialized, but the world was very different when, when they went through their process. And now the Chinese with a much larger population in a very different world where they're dealing with problems of pollution. We're all dealing with problems of rising sea level. I don't know what impact, by the way, that, that would have on China. There's lots of coastal coastal real estate, a lot of these coastal cities. The, the fact that this is the standard that they're holding themselves to, and not only they're holding themselves to, but they have, ad, they have, they have given the, their populations this metric by which to hold them accountable, right? Because since Tiananmen Square, that was the compromise, what you're describing, right? The compromise was, okay, listen, let's chill a little bit on all this political freedom. Uh, it's all great and everything, but let's focus on, we're going to give you growth. We'll give you economic growth. You give us political power, right? And that breakdown is what could cause social unrest in the country. And that's, that's ultimately what they fear, right? It's not the middle income trap. It's not demographics. It's not debt. It's social unrest. Absolutely. It is the, it is the hold of the party over the nation. And so sort of anything that sort of potentially undermines that is, is really the threat. And that's what that's what this I mean, I think that's underlying what this book is really about. Right. At the end of the day, that's what this is ultimately about, because that's the question. Can the Chinese political class navigate this abyss and get to the other side with the country still intact, the political system, whether it's changed or not intact without having had a revolution of sorts or some major level of unrest? Yeah, I guess so, actually. I hadn't quite thought of it in such, you know, in, in exactly those terms. But yeah, I think that's... And what do you think the verdict is, Denny? Since you haven't thought of it before, I'm going <laughs> to put you on the spot right now. You know... <sighs> we, obviously, when I ask that, and I ask it fairly, I don't ask you to tell me for sure, you know, wh give me the, the best answer you can. What do you think? You know, what do you think when you look over that horizon? You know, I think... Mm -hmm. Actually, even seeing where that horizon is at the moment is becoming more and more difficult to identify. I think we're entering into a period of really extreme uncertainty when it comes to the Chinese economy and by extension sort of the political dynamic. And the reason is, I think, you know, we're only entering the very early stages of this US-China trade conf conflict. The, the, the fallout and the direction and the knock-on effects of what that's going to have, not just for China and the US, but for the greater global economy as well, it's, that's going to take years to sort of play out. Now, at the same time, I think in China, we're already seeing kind of like a hardening of the of the political environment. I mean, the 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 the, the tone or the sort of the the general environment of uh, that you sort of experience in people in places like Beijing and the rest of the, of the country is a lot. There's a lot less personal freedom. There's a lot more surveillance than there was even five or six years ago. And so I think the dynamics, both politically and economically, are just changing so much and so quickly at the moment. And it's really quite difficult to actually be able to know what China is going to look like in five years' time at this point. That's the second time you brought up the uh, trade war, the economic war with the United States. Is that? Do you think that's that's underappreciated in, in uh, the press here? That uh, I mean, they've been they've been talking about it, but I, I sort of glaze over when I when I I listen to it because I don't really have any way to quantify or understand it. Do you think it's a bigger deal than than uh, than most of us realize? I'm starting to think it's a huge deal. I mean, you kind of listen to the speech that Vice President Pence gave yesterday. I mean, he really took the idea of the trade conflict and put it in a much bigger context. I mean, this isn't just about steel jobs and trade balancing anymore. He sort of brought everything from sort of 
you know, human rights and Taiwan and, uh, you know, the technology issue and sort of lumped it all together and kind of started to sort of redefine U.S. relationship with China. Um, I think it was that th there was a story yesterday that Bloomberg ran. I'm not sure whether you saw it about how absolutely China, I, I posted it on Facebook and it got like you know more more play than anything else. The, the computer chip, the manufacturing I, chip. I think this is potentially a game changer. I mean, this all of a sudden puts supply chain is issues in starkly stark security terms. So you know if you know if originally the idea of the trade war, uh, kind of a fringe view, was ult the, the, the ultimate goal was to you know, uh, bifurcate global supply chains to sort of split, um, you know, the U.S. supply chain sort of off from China. I think increasingly that could actually be the direction that we're heading in. And if so, that has huge ramifications both for, you know, the cost of manufacturers in the United States, the economic opportunity for the rest of the emerging world, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the potential for growth and investment in China. I think that really has the potential to start reallocating resources globally. The quote that I was looking for when I was mentioning uh, Pence's speech, because we were referring to the same one, or maybe it wasn't his speech, I think it was actually a quote he gave to the Hoover Institute, and it had to do with election meddling. And he said that, that what the Chinese are doing to the United States right now, quote, pales in comparison to what China is doing, uh, so with what the Russians are doing, sorry, pales in comparison to what China is doing. And I was, and I was bringing that up from what Point of view. First of all, I know from my research in cyber war that the Chinese are actually far more adroit, at least from from my readings, than the Russians are. Uh, but I thought, in terms of a political strategy, I could see it sort of all coming together. As I've been watching and listening to this administration and their signaling, I think they're far more politically astute than American journalists understand. Mm. And I think that the incorporation of cyber war election meddling and basically acknowledging that there's election meddling happened in the United States, but then transferring that to, to the Chinese and pointing it in that direction. You know, I think it's all part of a general strategy to put the focus on China. And I think, you know, uh, just that alone, that more increasingly belligerent rhetoric with the Chinese and also the seemingly, again, I'm not at the administration, maybe there's there's uh, logic to this. There very well could be. I don't mean to, to suggest that there isn't, but the seemingly schizophrenic relationship with our allies, with the government's allies and its supposed enemies. This it, you could see it nowhere better than in in South Korea, North Korea, and uh, and and China, right? Uh, you know, it's it's conf it's a confusing time, and uh, I think all that uncertainty has failed to materialize in equities. It's mm -hmm. failed to materialize in the U.S. stock market, and the reality is, at least in the West. We've had a pretty good time the last 10 years. A, th a lot of things have been going well for us, and there are a lot of black swans on the horizon, whether it's a, a market downturn, whether it's a hurricane flying up the East Coast, another you know, more catastrophic storm than Sandy, increasing levels of, uh, of uh, turbulence in, in our climate, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's... I want to. I'll let you get the last note in here, Denny. I know. I know you're on a tight, tight timeline. You got to get to the airport. No, to be honest, Dimitri, I don't have much more to add than that. I think it's. Uh, you know, I. I think we're very much entering uncharted territory at the moment, and I think. Uh, you know, the the way, not even just the trade relationship, but I think the way that China and the U.S. Uh, relate to each other and engage with each other, where it be in education and students, whether it be cross-border investment in technology or anything else, or whether it just be the trade relationship, or even how the two countries see each other from just a security standpoint. I, it feels like all of those things are in flux at the moment. And how that plays out is going to have an impact, not just on the Chinese economy, but certainly it, it will have an impact on, on the, the US side of things as well. I want to encourage listeners to to get Denny's book. It is, I mean, I, I've I've loved having Anne and uh, Elizabeth on the show and uh, love them. Uh, this is the best book I've read on on China. I I love the anecdotes. I was actually going to ask you if you brought me a lavender bear. I guess you, <laughs> I guess you haven't. If if you have one one minute, uh, <laughs> seriously, when I went to this to this this uh, lavender farm selling teddy bears. The, it's in the, the book, by the way, the story. It'll make sense. I should have bought as many as I could because everybody I spoke to all all wanted a bear. They all wanted a lavender Absolutely. bear. Absolutely. It's another it's another incredible story of the of the power of the Chinese consumer. 
whether it's with Hollywood, whether it's uh, aged by, what's it called? By Joe. By Joe. So I do encourage listeners, if you're interested in, in uh, really, I think, um, uh, textured uh, anec- f- story full of anecdotes, but also numbers and facts from someone that's obviously spent a lot of time in China and thought about these things. I do encourage Dinny's book. And uh, Dinny, again, I, I, I want to thank you for coming on the program. No, it's been great to be here, Dimitri. Thanks. Thank you.